Hi, Professor Finn. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, really excited to talk to you. So you've done incredible work in meta-learning and wrote the seminal model agnostic meta-learning MAML paper. Could you talk a little bit about your work there? Why does meta-learning excite you? Why is it important? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, a lot of the motivation behind starting to look into things like meta-learning was that uh, I was actually working a lot in robotics and trying to get robots to learn how to do things like pour water or grasp an object or use a spatula to lift an object, those sorts of tasks. Um, and we're using machine learning in a particular form of, re uh, of machine learning called reinforcement learning to enable the robot to learn these tasks. However, uh, like ultimately you want a robot not to just do one thing, you want a robot to do many different things. And the way that we were training these robots, the robot was learning from scratch, tabula rasa, for every single task that it was performing. And this is quite dissatisfying because if you think about how humans learn new tasks and so forth, you have a breadth of prior experience that you're leveraging when you're trying to learn new things. And so the motivation behind a lot of our work in meta-learning is basically trying to figure out how to enable machine learning systems to leverage previous experience in a way that allows them to learn new things more quickly. Uh, and ultimately, I, I'm really hopeful that this, uh, the kind of the framework of meta-learning provides one way to do that uh, by explicitly optimizing for the fast learning of new tasks, both for robotics, but also hopefully for other applications as well. Awesome. And kind of you mentioned robotics. Uh, could you talk a little bit about your work kind of in the development of intelligent behavior, like through interaction? Um, and I know you've done really cool work more recently on reinforcement learning for robots in changing environments when um, the world isn't static. Could you talk kind of about your uh, work there? Yeah, definitely. So one of the areas that we've been looking at in meta-learning isn't just to be able to quickly learn new skills, but also be, to be able to adapt to different environments and different change, different changes to the world that you're in. And so what we did is we um, we took we actually combined meta-learning with what's called model-based reinforcement learning, where the robot learns a model of the world, learns to predict forward what the world will look like based on the actions that the robot takes. And we took this, we actually were, in this case, we're actually looking at legged robots. So we had this li little um, six legged robot that was actually developed and built in another lab at, at Berkeley where I did my PhD. And what we were looking at is whether the robot could be able to adapt to running on different terrains, to running when it's lost one of its legs, to running where it's going up a slope or where it has a payload or maybe the battery level has changed. We want to basically look at if it can very quickly adapt its model of the world to these different changes and be able to kind of understand what the how how the predictive model will change when the world changes. And in particular, when you apply meta learning to this setting, you want to be able to adapt very, very quickly with a, a very small amount of data. And what this actually meant in the context of locomotion is that the robot was actually adapting online. It was adapting with only milliseconds of experience. Uh, it would basically, as it was running, it would kind of collect, uh, kind of observe some experience, use that to adapt its model of the world. And then uh, with its adapted model, it would replan a new trajectory and a new set of, um, of motor commands to, to actually continue running in that direction. So we were able to train it across multiple, multiple different trains and then, and then ultimately find that the robot could successfully learn to run in a straight line after having lost one of its legs, after having, having a payload and, and so forth. Wow, that's uh, very cool. Uh, do you have, kind of off of that, do you have a favorite type of robot you like to work with? A little bit, I know you mentioned legged robots. Um, is there something that in sort of that relates to locomotion, but is there a particular domain of robotics that most excites you? Yeah, I think that all sorts of robots are, are exciting. It's always just really satisfying to see learning actually happening, happening in the physical world in front of you. Um, I think that my favorite is probably working with robot arms, which is also where I have the most experience because it introduces so many different challenges. Um, it's a setting where learning is really, really a critical part of the pipeline to enable robots to do things intelligently because robots are always going to be encountering objects that they've never seen before. Um, just like people in environments are always encountering new objects and if you try to hard code something into the robot, 
if it runs into something that it hasn't seen before, it won't be able to recognize it, it won't be able to figure out how to manipulate it in order to accomplish its goal. So, um, yeah, it's an area that's both kind of very fascinating and very challenging. It's also an area where it seems so basic and innate to humans. It seems like it's so easy to grasp objects, to pour water, to make a bowl of cereal. These are all things that we can do almost without thinking, uh, but they're also really extremely hard to reproduce in, in real robots. And kind of going off that, how important do you think interaction is towards developing intelligent behavior? So in like computer vision systems where they might just be looking at images and not actually interacting with the world, how critical do you think it is to have interaction in your robotic systems towards intelligence of some kind? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think that the jury is still out on whether or not it's like a critical and essential component of, of developing intelligent systems. In my mind, I think that it's, I think that some form of interaction, I, I personally think that it's quite important um, because when you ultimately deploy these systems, they are going to be deployed into a world that is the future that always often looks different than what's happened in the past. Uh, we've seen that right now with all of the various, um, various situations that are going on in the world. So um, if you kind of train something on, on data that was collected in the past, try to deploy it now, it probably wouldn't be quite as successful. And if it can then kind of leverage its interaction with the world, it's kind of it's grounding with the, with the world to improve itself, then I think it will be more successful at handling the non-stationarity that we see in the world every day. And that interaction doesn't need to be actually like touching physical objects with the physical embodiment. It may also be just um, interaction in the form of dialogue or text or interaction in the form of receiving feedback from a human or, or or feedback from other another physical process in the world. And you sort of mentioned earlier how humans can do some of these tasks really easily, but robots can't. Are there any particular fields you look to for inspiration in your work or um, to kind of bring new perspectives, either cognitive science or other areas? Yeah, so I definitely get some high level motivation from cognitive science and neuroscience, and also just what I observe in humans being able to do it every day. Um, so for example, there is some work in cognitive science that shows that um, shows that in in animals, in some animals, and I think that also in humans, um, that basically is the representation of the world can change depending on what the task is. And so even if you're in the same exact environment, if what you're trying to accomplish or the reward structure like that you're getting is different, then your representation of that environment may also change. And so people have shown this, um, there's actually some researchers at Stanford uh, who have shown this in, I believe in mice, uh, looking at, uh, I believe grid cells and how this, how the, like kind of the representation of grid cells uh, in the world changes based on the reward that the mouse gets. Um, and then other researchers such as uh, Yale Niv, for example, have looked at if you're crossing the street versus, uh, versus hailing a taxi, what you're paying attention to, like the velocity of cars or the color of cars, Will, will change uh, dramatically. Cool. So, and, okay. um, so being inspired by those, yeah, being inspired by those, one of the things we're looking at is how we might, how the task might inform the representation of the robot is using when trying to solve a task. Very cool. Um, so are there any, uh, or what are some of the biggest outstanding challenges you face either in meta learning, robotics, or scalable AI in general, or the intersection of them? Yeah, so I'd say there are two, two primary challenges um, that I'll touch on that I think are really the, at least the, well, there's, there's more than that, I guess, uh, but I'll, maybe I'll primarily focus on two. So one challenge is that in many areas of machine learning, we've, there's been a ton of success with collecting really massive data sets and learning from those data sets. And we've seen this with things like ImageNet, where you can learn classifiers that generalize that are useful for transfer to many different tasks. And we've also more recently seen this with some of the natural language tasks, for example, with GPT-3, where you collect a really massive data set and train a huge model on this data set, and it's really able to generalize much more broadly than, than what we might imagine. And so this, these have been some like pretty big success stories, but one of the challenges has been thinking about what that looks like in the context of robotics. So collecting data, the typical algorithms that we use to train robots typically require some supervision in the loop. For example, the robot will try the task, 
the human will say that was great, that was okay, that was bad, something like that, and then the robot will try again. But if a human is kind of required to be a part of the data collection process every single step of the way, and you have this very serial process, it's very difficult to collect data, collect data at the scale of what we've seen in like GPT-3 or um, like image models trained on ImageNet. So one of the things that we've been thinking about a lot is figuring out, well, first, is there any existing data on the internet that we could use to enable robots to learn, for example, Maybe we could collect a lot of data of videos of humans doing tasks, uh, and that would contain a lot of really interesting interaction with the world that would also kind of show the robot different ways to solve different tasks, and also show a huge breadth of things, the breadth of environments and so forth, so that even if the robot is primarily trained in the lab, it also has all this other experience of watching humans in many other environments, and also thinking about how we can scale data collection on the robot side of things. So can in in essence, it really seems like the robot should be better at collecting data than in other fields because the robot can collect its own data. Um, and if we just get enough robots store all of our data and the robot share data, then we should be able to move towards the regimes that all these other areas um, are operating in. So trying to essentially bring robotics to the kind of modern data driven part of, um, of the rest of machine learning. And now the second challenge that I'll talk about is not really, is kind of a step ahead of where robotics is. So I feel like a lot of machine learning is kind of a bit ahead of where robotics is. And I think the big challenge right now facing machine learning is we have the ability to learn from these massive data sets. But what, even then, there's always things that are a little bit out of distribution that aren't well represented in the data that you've seen. And machine learning models fail pretty fantastically in these different situations. Um, and there's there's many different examples of this um, that you can find on the internet, whether it be image classification models or um, or uh, language models or something. They're not very robust to these different things, even situations that humans are quite robust to. And so I think that the really big open challenge at the forefront of machine learning is thinking about how we can handle this sort of shift in the data distribution and be able to generalize the situations that are a little bit different from what you've seen before. And I think to solve this problem, we're going to need to think a bit more out of the box than what we typically do. I think that in machine learning, we're often are in the setting where we assume that the training data and the test data is drawn from the same distribution, they're drawn IID, you shuffle all the data and so forth. And so to, to be able to build robust models that can work outside of the data distribution, we're probably going to need to move away from some of those assumptions that we know and love. Interesting and really inspiring to think of kind of going forward. Uh, what excites you most about your research uh, that you're working on now or in the coming years? Yeah, um, I'm, I feel like I'm excited about all sorts of things. Uh, both of the problems that I mentioned before, I think are really interesting and fascinating problems, uh, especially given that they're, they seem to be so fundamental um, to aspects of machine learning and intelligence. I'm always quite excited to see results on real robots. Um, I think that it, a lot of the field in robotics uses simulation as a tool to test out different algorithms, which it's a really useful tool. We use it all the time. It allows you to iterate faster. You can kind of take your robot in simulation. You can simulate faster than real time. You could have like 10 simulations running at once and so forth. Uh, uh, it's also really easy to evaluate and so forth. You can kind of measure every, every object in the world and everything. But when you're in simulation, it's also really easy to uh, cheat in various ways that you kind of don't really realize are unrealistic to the real world. And so I really get excited when we actually see robots in the real world doing things that, that look somewhat intelligent uh, and are, are kind of breaking down big challenges when they're actually deployed in the real world. And kind of shifting gears a little bit more to your personal background, I know you worked at Google Brain. Could you talk a little bit about how working in industry has been a little bit different from academia for people that might be interested or like thinking about both. Yeah, so I like being a part of both. I also I think that I I like academia a lot. Um, and if I had to choose kind of one or the other, I would definitely pick academia. I think that there's um, I mean there's there's there are various downsides, but I think that it's really fun to work with students uh, and and also have, I think, kind of a really 
um, a lot of camaraderie and collaboration across, like within the group, but also across groups at other groups at Stanford. There's a lot of really amazing groups at Stanford doing things ranging from computer vision to natural language to really deep theoretical work to um, various applications uh, like recently that people were looking at how you could use um, machine learning techniques to optimize battery life, for example. Um, so that's one thing that I really like about academia. Um, also, there's kind of new students coming in. There's like, um, yeah, always always a lot of new people and, and so forth that are always really excited. It's also a lot of fun to work with undergraduate students and get them involved in the research as well. Uh, I also like the teaching aspect of things um, in academia as well. It also gives you an opportunity to have impact in a way that's a bit different than your research. Um, one of the things that I really like about working at Google is that it has given me the opportunity to really test out what some of these algorithms look like when you deploy them at scale. Uh, and I think that that's really it's important. I think that moving, as I was mentioning before, kind of moving to real robots and testing things out in the real world is really important. And in that same sense, I think that also looking at what your algorithms perform, looking how your algorithms perform at a larger scale is also really important to understand if those algorithms will actually have practical impact when they're actually moved towards a larger scale setting. Um, a setting where there are more robots, more data, more tasks that you're trying to learn, um, and bigger models, for example. And like one thing that I've learned there, for example, is that the simplicity of an algorithm is really helpful and important when you're trying to scale it. If you have a really complex algorithm and you're trying to kind of deploy this in a really large scale system with a lot of data, it's really hard to debug each and every component of that algorithm. And the simplest things, the ones that you can kind of code up pretty simply, you can debug easily, you can visualize things and understand how it's working. Those are the algorithms that are much easier to actually deploy at scale. And that's encouraged me to, to really have a greater bias towards simple algorithms in my research. Um, yeah, and I guess one other thing, I guess, you mentioned personal background. I actually wasn't really at all planning to go to academia um, when I was in college. Both my parents uh, were engineers in industry, or still are, well, one of them is still an engineer in industry. One of them is actually now a teacher. And I was, my kind of impression growing up was that kind of working in industry was the way that you had really real world impact by developing products. And I had a lot of misconceptions about academia being very theory focused and not having a lot of really practical impact. Um, and throughout my undergrad, some of those perceptions changed as I was uh, actually realizing what it's like to be a grad student, what professors do. Um, some mentors of mine also actually encouraged me a lot to consider going to grad school and so forth. Um, I was also worried that a PhD would be a really long endeavor, uh, but I really loved the time that I had in my PhD. You basically get to work on the research that you're excited about the most. You don't have to worry as much about funding, at least in my experience. And so I, in, in many ways, I wish I could kind of go back to grad school and spend more time um, doing research without some of these, all the other obligations that you have when you're a professor. Really interesting uh, perspective. And kind of from a teacher hat, uh, for students that are interested in getting into machine learning, would you recommend that they kind of start more on the theory side or figure out like an applied project that they're really interested in and figure out what um, they might need to know for that or kind of a mixture of both? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I would definitely take uh, kind of an introductory class on, on machine learning and, and AI. I think that there's all sorts of online resources for that if you're not at kind of a university and if you are at a university then it's great to take advantage of the offerings that you have there. Um, and then after that if you want to kind of dig in a little bit deeper, I think that trying to seek out research opportunities is a great opportunity to try to dig in and get a sense for what it's like to do research in an area. Um, I guess one of the one of the reasons why I decided to go into academia too is that I realized a lot of the work in industry um, is really focused on taking existing algorithms and deploying them in various situations rather than actually developing new algorithms and developing new techniques. And I was really excited about the latter, the latter form of work where you're actually trying to solve problems that haven't been solved before. So um, yeah, that's kind of 
getting a sense for what research is like is, is good if you're interested in, in kind of getting a sense for doing AI and machine learning more in the long term with regard to actual development of new algorithms. Um, yeah, and then also just getting your getting your hands dirty, trying out different projects and different techniques. There's just so much open source code out there. There's so many things that you can try really with very minimal um, resources and so forth. Uh, there are some things that are helpful, like having a GPU is helpful, but um, there's even a lot that you can do just with it, like a laptop and access to GitHub uh, to get your hands dirty and try a few things out. So you've mentioned many different things there, but do you have any final question, like parting advice for students that are interested in AI and machine learning broadly? Um, I guess one thing, so I think that whenever you come to the advice, it's hard to make general statements. But one thing that worked really well for me uh, during my PhD was to try to really find things that I was honestly very excited about and felt like was the most important thing to be working on and was addressing one of the most important problems. There's, of course, a balance to strike when doing research, which is you want to pick problems that are really exciting and hard, but also pick problems that you know how to make some progress on. Uh, but if you only kind of pick the ones that you know how to make progress on and not the ones that you find exciting, then it's going to be hard to devote kind of a lot of time and energy into them. And I felt that, I felt that a lot of the work that I was doing during my PhD was almost like kind of in some ways play rather than work. And that made it really easy to work really hard because I was felt like I was playing very hard and just really enjoying myself and learning all sorts of things by reading papers and also trying out new techniques and trying to solve problems that I found to be really fascinating. That's awesome. Uh, thank you. That was the last question. So thank you so, so much for taking the time out of your day to speak. Uh, so thank you so much.